I spy ice. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he, I, I, he didn't even go into the snow. Like the snow is just so hard that there was no chance. Dude, this is going to be a dangerous cop. Maybe we don't run on these conditions tomorrow, but maybe there's a chance that it snows, you know? What about a late afternoon? It just needs to warm up, really. Like, it's safe to put it to it's, it's, uh, it's hard. I'm worried there are going to be some pretty bad crashes. For what? For skiers, huh? Yeah. It's like, you know, somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah. Know? It's a, an extreme sport, and you're on the top of these mountains with a huge cliff below you, and there's risk. And your friend's putting it all on the line just like you are, and you want the best for them. You don't want them to fall. The shared camaraderie of this just gnarly sport. <laughs> Safety comes to mind, right? Like, we all want to do really well, we want to figure out what to do. There is a safety question because it's crunch time and you know that. Yeah, I agree. So, that's it. so now we have no big plan. <laughs> For the last 25 years, the decision on holding an event or not is first of all on the uh, safety criteria. Then on the number of lines so that you can have a proper contest. The sport has progressed drastically. Riders are going faster. They're jumping further. They're putting tricks that are more and more complex in their jumps. This has been possible because there is a strong base and grassroots. I feel like I'm the next coming generation, but I'm trying to push it and trying to hit the bigger drops. I love pushing myself, that's like my favorite thing about skiing, but it's hard for me to push myself when the snow isn't that good. We've just uh, consulted and we believe we are not there to hold an event on ozone as it is. It's warmer winters uh, everywhere. It's impacting snow conditions and we have a responsibility towards our uh, next generations. It's like a mix of feeling really excited for the future and especially for the future of females, but then I feel a little bit doomed in the climate respect. It's too late already, like we need to go now, you know, and I feel like not everyone feels that way. A lot of people see what's gonna happen as down the line and future generations are gonna bear all the negative impacts of it. It's kind of our own personal responsibility as citizens in this world to do something about it and not just be bystanders and let the world just collapse in front of us. We have a responsibility to take care of the place we live in. I want my kids and grandkids to be able to enjoy the outdoors just like uh, I get to. And I just believe it's a responsibility of mine to reduce my impact, negative impact I have. Ski resorts have a responsibility in showing a good example and they will be dependent on the rest of the world taking actions. As a skier, obviously I want to keep skiing, keep riding glaciers, exploring and even in the past like five years I've noticed a lot of sick zones are just not the same as they were and it's pretty tragic to see that. The downward path we're taking with more pollution, more pollution, more emissions, more emissions. It's going to be irreversible soon and I, it's just, I don't know, it's really scary. The event is on hold. And we'll come back to you by the night, around 6, with a call. Skiing is at like the front lines of climate change. Which like, a hundred meter... It sounds like not much, and you think, 
My parents were both huge skiers, so I was kind of born into the sport and naturally just that passion developed and grew into something that really I just want to center my whole life around. Just become addicted to the mountains and do whatever I can to spend time out there. Exploring more in the backcountry and the mountains has definitely opened my eyes to more of the direct and like immediate impacts of climate change. The more you go out to the same zones, you'll notice that they are changing each year. The way the whole ski world's designed is not conducive to an environmentally friendly lifestyle. If you want to make it in the ski world and you make it to the World Cup circuit, you're basically just flying internationally all winter long. You can make the decision yourself to stop doing that, but then that's just going to hold you back. Oh, it's done here. My name's Kai Smart. I'm a slope style skier from Whistler, BC and a student studying business at the University of British Columbia. I've never revealed that I'm in university to the ski world. No. I keep it on the down low. <laughs> <laughs> Take some, some cute Insta pics. <laughs> right now, we're at the University of British Columbia. We're gonna go interview Simon Donner, a climatologist. Oh, this is it. Hi. Hey, how are you? Hey, yeah. Hi, how's it going? Thank you. I'm a funny person to be asking about this because I'm a climate scientist by living, but I am a, uh, a consumer of the sorts of things you are doing in our spare time. Anybody who's a skier, right? You're a skier, a snowboarder, et cetera. I've been skiing for 30 years. You know how unpredictable the winter is, mm -hmm. right? Because there is this variability, but what the trend overall is going towards is shifting into rain more than snow more often, mm -hmm. right? So it means that the freezing line moving up in the mountains, right? It means weather events like the one we had last fall that caused the heavy flooding, right? Which are not just wet, they're warm. And that's what's so dangerous about them, right? Because you bring in a warm weather system in the middle of the winter mm -hmm. and it dumps all this heavy rainfall, not just at the sea level, but up high in the mountains. It was raining at like 2,500 meters. Right? So this is one thing, obviously a big concern for avalanches, et cetera. Sure, yeah. It's hard to say exactly what the impact would be, but also just the feasibility of snow sports in different locations becomes a question, right? Mm -hmm. The North Shore Mountains here in Vancouver, you know, 2050 and beyond, it's going to be really hit and miss as to how much snow sports are going to be possible. So lots of opportunities still at the very top of Whistler, but I think you're going to be uploading and downloading. Yeah. Yeah. Kai, for somebody like you, I do this for a living, but you have a platform I don't have. And when you're trying to reach out to people and engage about climate change, I mean, in the end, most folks are only gonna sort of trust an evidence, trust an argument when it comes from somebody they trust. And so there's audiences for whom I'm a, a good voice, but there's all sorts of ones that I'm not the voice, right? That the scientists aren't the people to be there. We need to be partnering with folks like you. And so you have a, an opportunity there. There's so many ways we could be trying to change, not the climate message, but the climate messengers. Kaylee.
the noise to it that fall. Awesome. Nice work, Kelly. You're killing it. Okay, I just want to see this knee, okay? Can you put this one down? Hey, get the fix. Okay. Okay. Uh. Well, here we are. Obviously not the snow conditions that we were dreaming of, but... Uh, yeah, it's been pretty bad here yeah. too, all season. But I'm hurt anyways, so I haven't been <laughs> skiing that much. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's less frustrating then. Yeah, exactly. I don't have the FOMO. <laughs> At first it was a bit confusing for us if we would have the credit or not, because, I mean, it's in the name. We are Free Ride World Tour, and this is not quite sustainable. But then we're like, hey, we have to try and get better. Yeah. So we started with just a few actions, uh, like offsetting the travels of the writers and the staff and the media. Um, and now we have a proper plan. Why do you think your generation is more aware than ours? Like, I mean, we're like seeing big things every year, big changes with the climate. And we talk about it a lot. And especially when like in yeah. skiing, being in this industry, it's like, it's, it's definitely a topic and it has to be a topic that we talk about, you know? So yeah, yeah I think that could help. Yeah. <laughs> Nice to meet you as well. <laughs> Sorry about your leg. Yeah, no, it's okay. You got it's surgery and everything, I heard, yeah. right? I did, That's but exciting. it's mending. It's getting better. Yeah. Hopefully I'll be off the crutches soon. Yeah, I mean, getting the surgery and forward yeah. momentum is the biggest part. Totally. Do you guys do anything to your actual um, helicopters to like help with the carbon emissions? Like, is that <sighs> something you can do? <laughs> okay, so not immediately, to right. be honest. We have been doing a lot of research on sustainable aviation fuel. I believe you're able to run a 50-50 blend okay. of normal jet A fuel with sustainable aviation Same. fuel mm -hmm. currently. Um, the hard part is it's hard to get because yeah, they've only been producing it for a short amount of time yeah. and not in a great volume. Right. Um, and we were the first full service helicopter company worldwide to become completely carbon offset, which was neat and, you know, almost kind of surprising that, that yeah. we were the first to, to go down that road. These changes do need to come from higher up and they need to come from... Yeah, and, and you know, as far as uh, larger legislation coming into place, I think it, it is them looking to the impact of, of small organizations yeah. and, and how that could... Um, find its way up to the top and, yeah. and you know I think I think the little impact will, will grow. There's heli ski operators that have uh, become carbon positive and I think that's yeah. that's even better. You know a big part of our tourism program is yeah. like we want to let people know that we're offsetting this flight for you mm -hmm. um, but also just somebody going out and flying around throughout our tours our tour pilots talk about the changes that they've seen in the last mm -hmm. five to twenty years flying yeah. around here you know there's very visible changes in I'm the glaciers sure, yeah. in this area right. um, that are immediately recognizable <laughs> handles on the seats on the oh, sweet. thank you should i come to the back or wherever you want you can sit in the okay, front cool. yeah. sit in the front with you then yeah. oh, got it the leg have you cool. ever flown in a helicopter before i haven't no i wish oh yeah <laughs> it's good to like see it like there's one thing, like obviously you're being in the helicopter maybe is not the best thing for the environment, but then seeing what you're trying to protect mm -hmm. is also mm -hmm. valuable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was on this one flight by myself right. and I don't know why this thought came across my mind, but I was thinking, man, we're spending billions of dollars to try to get to Mars, which looks like Arizona. We well, should be spending <laughs> that billions of dollars trying to preserve all of this. Yeah. Like this spectacular. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing too, yeah. yeah. We've got a pretty good world we here. We do have a pretty good world. We should probably focusing our resources on it yeah. now before we go to the Arizona of uh, the <laughs> <laughs> Totally. One of the big challenges we're, we're facing right now is that most of how we live our lives and the systems we live in, right, they are not designed for transformational change. 
We do incremental things, but right now we need really transformational change. I flew someone the other day and they were, we get in and they've never been in a helicopter before and I think the guy's comment was, a hundred years ago people weren't even flying and now we're in a machine that can hover and go backwards. And, oh, that's and so it's true. And you're like, yeah, it hasn't been that long and I'm thinking like, there'd have to be some crazy technological advancements in my lifetime to see a fully electric helicopter. Yeah. I bet you a hundred years ago they weren't thinking that there was going to be a machine that could could hover could in even place do it. Yeah. And go forwards, backwards in any direction that we would like. Right. So the potential's there, but huh. yeah, you just never know. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. We want to save these behaviors that can pull carbon dioxide out of the air for activities that we have in society that we just can't reduce the emissions from. We do what we can, which is offset 100% of the operation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, we can't uh, reduce the amount that we fly, particularly in the more industry sector. We had extreme high temperatures last summer, exactly. which further accelerated an already aggressive fire season, okay. and then the extreme rains in the fall mm -hmm. were unprecedented. For us, it, it immediately has an impact on how much support we need to provide in these areas. Offsetting the, cannot really be an answer uh, on its own. Yeah. The first effort we have to do and that we are trying to do at Ferrari World Tour is reducing your emissions. Mm -hmm. Because this is the most important. The best emission is the one that is not produced in the first place. So what's like the biggest carbon emitter in the Ferrari World Tour? Would it be the helicopters or? A lot of people think that because this is the most obvious. <laughs> um, but uh, it's actually not. The biggest emissions are from uh, all the public, all the spectators coming. Uh, and oh, watching right. from the yeah. mountain, yeah. We made a, an analysis of the Verbi Extreme event and 80% of the impact was through transport of the public coming to the event. Okay, so that's something we don't have a direct uh, grasp on, but where we can uh, promote to limit your, your impact when you travel to, to an event. The footprint of the ski industry is huge because of all the people that travel to go ski. Those folks need to know that their industry is threatened by the fact that the planet's warming. A 747 or something like that takes to fly from here to Europe. I would have to fly probably probably in the 1200 hours range to burn that much oh my fuel. Gosh. Which mm -hmm. would take your average pilot maybe four years Damn. to fly. As you know, things change quickly in the mountains. The ozone face got absolutely scoured yesterday by the wind, so we are switching gears and looking for another option. As a platform and as a, a, a governing body of 6,000 licensed athletes, but a million fans, we have a tool there that we must use to, to push in the, in the right direction. Kicking Horse being the resort that it is, has this T1 South venue in the back pocket. So T1 South. I think that any event has no choice today but uh, follow that, that process. The public is watching, the public is concerned, and that's part of uh, the must-dos for, for any sports property. So we do have a slightly different change today. Saturday. It's a team effort, you know. Um, it's either we we all believe in that and we all pull in the same direction, or it won't be strong enough. How do we encourage all of these people traveling here if they're going to make this trip, and if they're going to be flying, they don't admit other parts of their lives. I know the superheroes of freeride are going to make an absolute glorious show out of this space today. Oh, what a fucking two! I know, right? Yeah! Let's go! <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Big respect for that one. Thanks, boss. All right, Michael, 10 seconds. Thank you. Confirm 10 seconds. Bib number eight, Michael Mon. Dropping in three, two, one, dropping. <laughs> Thank you.
To make change and to do well in whatever you're doing, you have to be passionate about what you do and you have to be having fun and enjoying it. If I cut out all competitions that involved a helicopter or all trips that required flying, I might lose my passion. And I want to reduce those in a way that's not reckless. I also want to use the platform I have to enact change that's even bigger than that by pushing some of these big community movements. I believe that the progression of the sport and held by, by this next generation is actually a, an advantage because they are very sensitive to this aspect and um, they will be the guys and girls that are making that curve really happen. Whether it's skiing or like hiking or just getting out into the natural world, I think the more you do it, the more you'll appreciate and respect and kind of fall in love with it. And I think that'll help open your eyes to how important it is to preserve what we have. It feels like all the facts are pointing to it not really working out for us. But I feel like there are enough people trying to make a difference that, that at least we're not alone. Like I'm not alone with being an optimist. Who knows what the environmental future holds, but young people like you give a shit. And that's where it matters. Once you give a shit, you'll start doing things that make a change so that we can keep our winters and we can keep treading. The opportunity to be on the Free Road World Tour is amazing and we are so thankful to have literally millions of fans around the world and it's a great platform to promote sustainability. Everyone has something they can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's contacting their local representative, letting this influence how they vote, whether it's how they travel around town, whether it's what you eat, what you buy. I mean, there are choices out there that all of us can make. And you don't have to start by trying to be perfect. Just start. I throw my old ways out the door They'll hit 